Assalamu alaikum. This is Yasmin Mujahid, and you're listening to Serenity, streaming live on One Legacy Radio. Uh, today, we're going to be talking uh, about a topic, uh, rather a question, uh, and how to answer this question. And that question is, why can't I get what I want? And this is a feeling that we often have as human beings, that I want a certain thing, and um, I can't have it. Why can't I have it? Uh, Another form of this question is why aren't my du'as being answered? Why do I keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this thing? I keep asking, I keep asking, and I'm not getting it. And so this is a situation which we often find ourselves in because we don't always get what we want in this life. Uh, So the question is why is that? And how should we start to understand this question and uh, more importantly the answer to this question? Well, I think part of the problem really goes back to the idea of what exactly is our goal? What exactly is it that we're trying to achieve? Uh, the, the problem that we fall into and why I think we get into this, this, the trap of this question uh, is that what we have done is we have, we have mixed and we have switched our means and our end. Uh, What I mean by that is our end is our goal in life. It's our goal. It's our destination. And the means is the vehicle or the tool to get there. Uh, And so what ends up happening is majority of us, even Muslims, even, you know, believers, we we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not our end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not our ultimate goal. Rather, we have other goals and other ends that have to do with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they may be things which are halal, but you have to see this is, this is why this, this problem is very subtle. Because my goal might be something halal, but nothing else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be my goal. Uh, everything else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only a means, is only a tool to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let me give you an example. If my goal is that I want to get married, that is my goal, that is my end. Now this is a noble thing to want, right? This is something uh, which is halal and in fact it is recommended to get married. And the Prophet sallallahu has said that, you know, that had referred to marriage as half of our deen. So then what's wrong with making my goal getting married? Well, the problem with that is that what if, um, you know, say that I, I make that my goal, uh, but what if for me personally, or, or maybe let me be more specific, suppose that my goal is to marry person X. So there's a specific person that I really, really want to marry. And because I want to marry that person, this is my goal, this is my uh, my end. So what I do is I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let me marry person X. Well, the problem with this scenario is I have made marrying person X my goal and I've made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my tool and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the means because I'm asking Allah, I'm using, in fact, I'm using Allah as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a tool, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, is the means in order to get to my goal, which is marrying person X. And I continue to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this thing that I want. And again, there's nothing wrong with asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what we want. But ultimately, when we make the thing that I want, the goal itself, no matter what happens, I want that thing. And the problem with that is suppose for a moment that in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, marrying person X is not good for me. Um, maybe marrying person X is not going to get me to my ultimate goal, which should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as a result, Allah does not give me what I'm asking for. But at this point, I'm very upset because ultimately, I just wanted to marry person X. I wasn't interested in necessarily what is going to get me to what is going to be best for me in my relationship with Allah and the reason why that happens is because I have made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the tool and I have made this thing that I want the end. And that's the problem. So in that scenario, that's a scenario where, uh, where I have mixed my means and my end. Now, if you switch that and you see it instead as it should be and you put everything in, their proper, in its proper place, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the end and everything else is the tool, in that case... I might ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, allow me to marry person X 
if it is good for me in my relationship with you, if it is good for me in my dunya and in my akhirah, if it is good for me with, in, in my path to you. And in that case, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow me to marry person X, it, I don't say, why didn't you give me what I want? Because I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what was best for me to, reach, to achieve my goal. And if my goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and suppose Allah knows that other than person X is better for that goal. But see, this, this issue of, of wanting, uh, you know, wanting things, the, the, that specific thing that I've asked for, the reason why we become very frustrated when we don't get that thing is because we're really ultimately not interested in, in, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as we are interested in just getting that thing that we want. Um, and we never stop to think that what if this isn't good for me and what if this isn't going, in fact, what if this is, this getting this particular thing is actually going to hurt my ultimate goal or my ultimate aim, um, which is, you know, achieving or, or being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this very well may be the case. I might be uh, attached to this particular thing where I want to marry person X, but person X is going to be the worst thing for my deen. And it might not be, and then you're going to have people now saying, but no, but person X is a very good Muslim, right? Of Person X has great deen, so how could they possibly be bad for my relationship with Allah? Well, there are many ways well, that, where how that could be the case. First, for example... When I am very, very attached, I could be very, very attached to person X. And even if they are the best Muslim in the world, my attachment to that person becomes stronger than my attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that way, person X was not good for me, even though person X was, you know, very religious and, you know, but, but, but person X is actually acting as a veil between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because my focus is on that person. And instead of being on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my attachment is to that person instead of being to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are a lot of ways which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best of why something we might want it and it's actually bad for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this uh, in the Quran when he says that it may be that you love something and it's bad for you. And, and it may be the other way around as well where you you might hate something and it's actually good for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and we don't know. So this is something that we have to keep in mind, but it's only possible to keep this in mind if we have our goal clear, that our goal is not person X, our goal is not getting into us, you know, college X, our goal is not getting, you know, career X, getting into med school, getting, you know, that's not our goal. That is a means. And those are all, again, halal things, and they can be very noble things. But in the end, they are just pathways to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're tools. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that that's not the best tool, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you a better tool. But you have to be very clear about what your goal is and what, and what is going to take you to that goal. Now, thinking about it in this way, when we start to think, uh, you know, that when we start to have our attachment to these other things as goals, rather than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what this also does is it breeds a sense of entitlement. And that sense of entitlement actually leads to uh, the most misery that a human being feels. It, it, really, it really comes from this, you know, this, this anger that we as human beings sometimes feel towards God uh, comes from this sense of entitlement, and it comes from these wrong attachments. So if I have an attachment to something, or I feel... Um, rather like entitled to something. I, I say, uh, I feel that this particular thing is good for me. And I've already defined it as good for me and best for me. Then after that, I feel that I am entitled to it. And so as a result, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give it to me, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he wills. Allah does not, uh, you know, is not subject to my desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't take commands from me. You know, just because I made dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to do it. You know, we have to understand Allah is, Allah is not working for us. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should be working for him. You know, he's not like our genie in the bottle. A'udhu billah. Like, like our, our problem really is that we, we take God as a tool, you know, something that we oh, wow, like we can use it, right? We can use it to get what we want. And that is, it, you know, this, this means that we have our whole perspective upside down. Allah is what we want and everything else should be a tool to get to him. 
And so this sense of entitlement is like, um, you know, I've been making dua and I'm asking for this thing and it's not coming, it's not happening. And I start to get angry, right? I start to get angry at Allah. Why aren't you giving me this thing that I want? You know, like as if I'm talking to a tool that isn't quite working properly, you know, and, and, and my, my feeling is I deserve X, Y, and Z. I deserve it. I am entitled to it. And if I'm not getting it, it breeds a sense of anger in me. And we have to check ourselves because we are not deserving of anything. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us is a blessing, is a gift. It's not something that I deserve or I can demand, but I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and, you know, don't get me wrong. This isn't to say that we shouldn't make dua for things we want, that we shouldn't ask Allah. In fact, Allah loves for us to ask, ask from him. But in the way that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not a demand. It is not, uh, it is not, I deserve this and, you know, give it to me right now. But rather it's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his mercy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wahhab. You know, one of the attributes of Allah is the one who loves to give gifts, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the, the one who loves to give. He is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. His mercy supersedes his wrath. And so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is something else to think about, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Wahhab, if Allah is the one who loves to give gifts, and if I continuously am asking Allah for a gift and it's not being given to me, that should make me stop and think. Because Allah, it's his, you know, the default is that he wants to give. The, in fact, the default is that he loves to give gifts. So if I'm not being given that gift, if that gift that I'm asking for or that my heart desires is being withheld from me, I should know that it is for my own good. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not withhold just because he wants to withhold. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to give. So if Allah is not giving us something, we should know that it is in the withholding that he's actually giving us because he is protecting us from something uh, which we don't see, uh, perhaps. Um, and so by withholding it, he's actually protecting us. Inshallah, I'm going to take a short break now. And when we return, we'll continue speaking on the question of why can't I get what I want? Assalamu alaikum, this is Yasmin Mujahid and you're listening to Serenity, streaming live on One Legacy Radio. Uh, we are talking today about the question of why can't I get what I want? Uh, and this is the question that a lot of human beings, we human beings, uh, fall into when we feel very frustrated. Uh, we feel frustrated that we're asking for something, we really, really want something very badly, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not giving it to us. And when this happens, we tend to become almost angry uh, or resentful towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're talking about this issue and why this happens. Uh, one of the reasons we said that this does happen is because we have our goal and our means, our end and our means switched. We have made the dunya and everything in it, whether it's marrying the person of my dreams or getting the job that I want or getting into the school that I, you know, that I applied for. Those are the ends. Those are our goals. And we use Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if he's a genie in a bottle. We use Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if he's a tool to try to get to those ends. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give us those things, we, you know, we get angry at him because, you know, we're, we're, we're using him and he's not coming through for us, you know. And so there's a really big problem in this uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a tool. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a means. Allah is the end. And, and, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what we should be seeking and not, not the dunya as our end. If it is Allah that we're seeking, then whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, when we, for example, when we pray istikhara and we're trying to make a decision, in our istikhara, we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma man kunta ta'lam anna hadha al-amr khayrun li fi dini wa ma'ashi wa aqibati amri faqdurhu li wa yassirhu li thumma barik li fi. Which means that if you know, if, if in your knowledge this thing is good for me, in my deen, in, so in my dunya and my deen, in my hereafter, in my, in my dunya and in my hereafter. 
then you know then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to give it to us and to put blessing in it and and to make it easy for us okay and then if and then we say when kunta ta'lam anna hadha al-am sharrun li fi dini wa ma'ashi wa aqibati amri fasrifhu anni wa asrifni anhu wa qdur lil khair haythu kan thumma ardini bi so in then we say and if this thing that you're asking for or you're asking about is not good for you then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to take it away from us and to take us away from it and then to bring us what is good for us and to make us pleased with it so it, this dua itself you know it's funny because when we when we pray istikhara we we pray we we get very attached to one choice right and then we go ahead and pray istikhara and we asked Allah in the istikhara <laughs> that we asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do to make this thing happen if it's good for us and to not make it happen and rather to take it away if it's bad for us then when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it away from us we don't want to let go we even though we we asked allah it's it's like we said allah if this is bad for us take it away and if it's good make it happen and after this happens sometimes allah takes it away things close things don't work out but we can't let go and we can't think for a moment that hey i made dua for this i made dua for what's best and isn't that all we any of us want is what's best who wants something if it's going to be bad for them nobody does but in our short sightedness we don't see this we don't realize that it's just because of our attachments that we can't let go and it may be that that thing that i'm holding on to for dear life is not good for me and in the end we just want what's good for me i just want what's good for me in my deen and in my akhira right in my i'm sorry in my dunya and my akhira so you know we 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 subhanallah human beings were sort of um it, in this strange state where we we hold on to things and we we don't want to let go of them even if they may be bad for us and we don't realize that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and we um we don't know we are completely blind to the unseen we don't know what 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 tomorrow brings we don't know what's good for us and what isn't and so we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the beauty of istikhara is that you're asking allah to do something and to make something happen if it's good for you and to take it away if it isn't after that we need to put our trust in allah and we need to really be clear in our minds what is our actual goal is our goal dunya or is our goal allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hereafter if it is allah in the hereafter then alhamdulillah allah heard your dua and allah is doing what's best for you if it didn't work out it's because inshallah that's best for you if it, it if it did work out or it's going in another direction you know you trust that inshallah that's that's also um best for you so these are the kinds of things that we have to keep in mind now i'm going to um ask you guys that you know this is live so if you want to go ahead and and ask your questions in the chat box give us your reflections um this is something that affects all of us because we all want things right and how do we deal with it when we don't get what we want uh one of the questions is how do we know if allah is just testing us what if i made istikhara things felt good and things went on perfectly but then things went downhill how do i know when to leave it and when to stay patient well you know part of istikhara is uh again i i ask for something and then i think might have been going you know going good as you, as you put it and then they started to go the other way that part of my trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't to hold on for dear life to one option or another but rather to hold on to allah so you, conceptually this is how you have to think about it everything else other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inconstant everything else if you try to hold on to it it will break this is how you have to think about it the only handhold that never breaks the only thing that's constant is allah himself and so in every situation if you hold on to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and go wherever he takes you instead of holding on to that thing instead of holding on to that person instead of holding on to that situation because when you hold on to those things you're holding on to the wrong thing if you hold on to the rope of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you try to go wherever allah is directing you then you'll be fine if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it work and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it not work you know khair alhamdulillah your reliance is on him it's not on the situation it's not on the person it's not on you know that job or that degree or whatever it is that you're holding on to of dunya it it, it, it sh- your reliance shouldn't be on those things cuz those things are inconstant and those things are constantly changing 
those things are, um, you know, they go up and down and they, they, they break and they leave and they die. And this is the sunnah, this is the, the, um, the reality of everything other than Allah. This is the reality of the creation. If you hold on to it, you're, you're just going to be on a roller coaster ride and you're going to end up falling because you're holding on to something that can't be held on to. You have to hold on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put your trust in Him. If you want to be solid, if you want to be, um, you know, stable yourself, because anytime you hold on to something that's unstable, you too become unstable. And this is a, you know, subhanAllah, uh, a lot of times there are, and I'll give you examples uh, even from the Quran, where, where you might see something as good for you and it's very bad for you. And you might see something as bad for you and it's actually very good for you. One of the examples of this, um, I'm going to give you two examples of the opposite case. One is the story of Al-Khidr and Musa alayhi salam. And we know this story from, um, from the Quran where Musa alayhi salam is following Al-Khidr. And Al-Khidr, uh, he does a number of things which Musa alayhi salam doesn't, doesn't understand. Because on the surface they seem, uh, these are things which don't seem to make sense. Um, and commentators say Al-Khidr was actually an angel, Allah ta'ala alam. So he was able to do these things by the command of Allah. And he, he knew what he was doing, but Musa alayhi salam couldn't understand. One of the things that Al-Khidr did was uh, there were some people um, in this town and he went ahead and started damaging their boats. And th these people were dependent on these boats. And so Musa alayhi salam is naturally very confused. Uh, like, why is he doing this thing that seems to be very bad, right? Seemingly harmful to these people. And it turns out later on when Al-Khidr explains it to, to Prophet Musa alayhi salam, that, th that he was that these people lived in a place where the king was stealing their boats, was taking the boats from these people. And as a result, it was leaving these people not able to, you know, f get the, their livelihood through, the, through fishing and that kind of thing. So because he had damaged them, he wasn't damaging them so much that they couldn't be used, but he was damaging them enough that the king wouldn't want them anymore. And so he would leave. In fact, through damaging the boats, he was actually keeping the boats for the people. So this, this is an example, and, and we're told this story for a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses stories in the Qur'an for a very specific reason. This is Allah. He doesn't just tell stories, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us a story to teach us a lesson. And this story was chosen in the Qur'an to teach us a very important lesson, that sometimes things appear on the outside as being bad, when in fact they're saving you, when in fact they're good for you. And this was an example where... It did seem like, like he was hurting the people, but in fact he was saving them and he was keeping the boats for them. Um, and, and on the other side of that, when something seems to be good for you and you chase after it and you hold on to it, and in fact it's very bad for you. Um, and that is, an, is through another story which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, and that's the story of Qarun. Qarun also lived during the time of Musa alayhi salam, and he was a man who was so rich uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his riches, you know, just the, fe the, the keys to his treasure basically was treasure in and of itself. He was so, so rich, and he used to walk among the people and show off his wealth. And there were basically two groups of people that were, that were told about in the Quran. There was the group of people who loved this life, the people who sought this life. And that was their and that was their goal. That group of people reacted very different. Reacted to uh, Qarun alayhi salam. I mean, sorry, Qarun, um, in a way that was they felt like um, very envious of him. They looked at him and they admired what he had, and they said, "Oh, that we had what what he has." So their their because their goal was dunya, they saw his wealth as something good. Okay, um, versus the other group of people were those who were given, you know, knowledge. Those people knew that there's something better than this, than this wealth that this man has. And they used to try to tell Qarun, you know, to be grateful and to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be, uh, you know, humble. But Qarun, in fact, thought and when he, the way he responded is, I have all of this because of a knowledge that I have. So, so first mistake here is that he has a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he attributed that gift to himself. He attributed that gift to his own knowledge. It's because he thought he was really great and really smart. And it was because of that that he thought he had all of this wealth. 
So it basically made him very arrogant and rebellious. And so what ended up happening to Qarun, as we're told in the Quran, is that he and his house were swallowed up by the earth. So Qarun was, was destroyed. And now you look the next day, Allah tells us, look at now the reaction of the people, the same people who used to seek this life, uh, who sought this life, the same people who were envious about his position the day before, said they're, now what they're saying is, Thank God that Allah did not give us what he gave Qarun, because had he given us what he gave Qarun, we also would have been destroyed. So now this is a situation, and, and the lesson from this, there are many lessons, but one of the lessons from this is having a lot of wealth and having the status, it's, it seems like a good thing, right? It's something that on the outside would seem that it's good. But sometimes, and I'm not saying always, sometimes it is not a good thing. Sometimes, in fact, it's that which ends up destroying a person. And so this is an example of something that seems to be good for you, but actually it's bad for you. Uh, and, and in the story of Qarun, that's exactly what happened, is that he had all this uh, wealth, and it actually was very bad for him because it made him arrogant and it made him uh, rebellious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are two examples from different stories in the Quran that teach us this lesson that I might really, really want something, but it's not good for me. And it may seem on the outside to be good. And in fact, it isn't. And similarly, I might just just not I'm, I absolutely do not want something. Um, and in fact, it's actually good for me. And it seems on the outside that it isn't. Uh, so, um, inshallah, I'm going to take more questions from the chat box. Um, OK, so. If a person loves another like no other, yet hates everything about that person, would that person be better off leaving this person or holding on in the hope that they will change, even if there is no indication or promise of any change? Should the person simply move on to another? So the question here is getting at uh, when is it that you're supposed to stay in a situation and when is it that you, you know, and and supposedly, you know, have sabr. What, what does sabr really mean? And when is it that you should try to, to change a situation? Um, and the, the question here, basically, uh, the, on a broader scale, is that what we should be doing whenever we're trying to uh, make a decision or, uh, you know, figure out how, which way we're supposed to go, it goes back to what I had said previously, and that is that we hold on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we ask and we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for what's best. Because sometimes our mistake really is that we hold on to other than Allah. So the reason why we are unable to let go of things uh, isn't because, sometimes it's not because, oh, I'm trying just to be patient and I'm trying to do the right thing. Sometimes it's just because I'm attached to this thing and I don't want to let it go. Um, and that's the problem. And that's when we end up hurting ourselves and hurting others, in fact. But if our attachment is to Allah, then it's, we go where Allah takes us. And, and this is where we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Allah to do what's best for us. And if it's a situation that you need to leave, then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. If this is something, and, and this is again, part of istikhara, Allah gives us tools. We have dua, we have istikhara, and we, we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to move us and to make decisions by Allah and not by my nafs and by my own um, my own false attachments to things. So the dangerous thing in any situation or, or in any choice, uh, the dangerous thing is to be acting uh, or reacting or choosing by the nafs, by the self versus by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if I make a decision by my nafs, it's never going to be good for me because my nafs uh, you know, only it, it, it pulls me to what is lower. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I make the decision by Allah and I'm seeking Allah for guidance and I'm seeking what Allah wants me to do, then whatever the decision is and whatever the outcome is, it will be good for me. So the key here is to let go of the other attachments and, and whatever it is that I am, um, you know, that I have, uh, that I can't let go of and let, letting go of that and putting my trust in Allah, making my attachment to Allah, and, and whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides for me, I'm willing to accept it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us not only patience, not only sabr, but even the higher level above sabr is rida, which is contentment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us content with his decision and, and to be able to 
to be uh, pleased with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides for us. أَقُولِ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفَرَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ إِنَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدَكَ نَشْهَدُ وَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا أَنْتَ نَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ